Good morning. Again, good to be out on this Lord's Day morning. Uh, certainly privileged to, to be assembled as many of us can be. Let's continue to keep in mind those who, for whom it's still wise to shelter in place. But uh, we're, we're glad to be here this morning. We are this morning going to continue to consider the book of Proverbs, the wisdom of Solomon, gained throughout a lifetime of experiences. You could say maybe gained from some of his own hard knocks brought on to him by his own foolish actions when he was younger. But through life experience and through seeking the counsel of other wise men, he's come to a different, an entire different way of living in his later years. Certainly his priorities changed. What he seeks for his sons has changed. What he seeks for the people of Israel has changed. And certainly it is by that gained by having a reverence for God, revering all that God consider sacred and holy. Again, wisdom is attaining a set of skills for living to a certain standard, a standard of life that God has set. But speaking not only in spiritual matters, but even in, in matters physical in this life, which in effect are spiritual, how you treat others, how you would handle all your personal affairs, what kind of people you would associate with. We'll see today even some that you ought not associate with. We had begun talking about wisdom and attaining it and seeking it and how it acts and how the benefits of it. And then last week we transitioned to the next topic talking about the scoffer. The scoffer is the person who is known just to revile everything. And oftentimes, in the reviling everything, it, beyond being what they don't want, they want to bring everybody else down with them. We considered last week the one character trait that's common to all scoffers and really common to all sinners is Second Peter 3 and verse 3. They're following after their own lust. They're quite sure they've got it figured out, and this is the way. And so following after their own lust, the, the scoffer doesn't seek what is better, but seemingly lives to mock what is better. And we considered, you know, those who would dare to correct the scoffer, well, probably it isn't going to be very, very well received, is it, Deborah? It's... Proverbs 9, verses 7 through 8. He who corrects the scoffer, what's going to happen to them? Even if, you know, this assumes they come to that person in the right spirit and the right attitude, seeking to help. In Proverbs 9, verses 7 through 8. He corrects the scoffer, gets dishonor for himself. And he who reproves a wicked man gets insults for himself. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will still be wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase his learning. Well, there's about every way you could respond to some godly counsel there, isn't it? He who corrects the scoffer gets dishonor. That's what he's going to receive back from the scoffer. What you got, Jill? Well, I was just thinking, when you put this in the correlation, because last week we talked about the scoffer is one of the things he knows about. Mm -hmm. So he's not going to be receiving your counsel. Yeah. But then in the same context, it's a question about this is truly a wise man who can talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's part of one of the dangers we mentioned last week. There is a danger uh, 
figuratively speaking, a danger in wisdom for those who think they have it and don't. And here's the scoffer. He thinks he's got it, doesn't he? He's quite sure that he's the only one that knows what's right and anything else. Always the, the benefit or the advantage of the wise man is he never stops learning. He's, he, he might receive some counsel that's not worth being kept, but he's going to hear it. He's going to discern, have discernment, know what to disregard and what to keep. But this person that just lives to, to, to mock, this, he lives to insult, really. To, and in that way, I mean to, to tear down what is godly. He displays wickedness. He, he displays his, his hatred for others. He really just despises someone that has a different standard. Again, wisdom is about having the skills to live to a set standard. And if you determine you're going to live to that standard, and he's not, what's the only way he thinks he can save face? Tear down your standard. You gotta be a fool for living that way, you know, as the world would, would say. The scoffer sees himself as the only person who's always right about everything. You know, that's not a very, there's some really ugly pictures in, in this subject of scoffing. Proverbs 15 and verse two. The, the scoffer, he just doesn't love a corrector. He doesn't favor anyone that would bring a corrector, a correction. Proverbs 15, verse 2, the tongue of the wise man makes knowledge acceptable. So that's the one that's coming. He's, he's coming in a right attitude with a right heart to, to give good counsel. But how is it received? But the mouth of fools spouts folly. How can you, that's, that's real scoffing. When you can take in, in a sense, fresh water and spew up mud, isn't it? Which is about what they do. And so it's, it's certainly getting filtered through a, a foolish mind. It, the, the scoffer does not love a corrector. He, he stays away from the rebuke. That's a McCord translation. The scoffer does not love a corrector. He stays away from wise men. To, to such a person, really, wisdom is the greatest threat. It's the greatest threat because wisdom, if a scoffer would receive wisdom, what does it require him to do, him or her? First, he's going to have to have humility. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. First, he has the humility to receive it, which makes it possible to repent. Then he's going to have to treat other people with fairness. What does the scoffer not do? If you challenge a scoffer, they're going to in turn more than likely attack you. Again, I, I, I can imagine Solomon teaching this to his own sons. They're pretty privileged, rich boys. You know, and... They probably think we can do whatever we want. But to treat others with fairness. True wisdom then is the greatest threat. It's, it's about like shooting an arrow through a hot air balloon. I mean, what happens? I mean, your world comes apart. If they would actually accept this wisdom, then everything's going to change. Look at Proverbs 14 and verse 6. Imagine you are such a person and somebody shot an arrow through your hot air balloon full of arrogance and you came crashing down. You think, well, maybe that would be enough to change folks, wouldn't you? But chapter 14, verse 6, a scoffer seeks wisdom and finds none, but knowledge is easy to one who has understanding. Why does he not find it? Not really looking, is he? I mean, it, as we just talked about, the, this, is, this is a person that's following after their own lust. We're not talking about somebody that just scoffs. We're talking somebody that does it as a lifestyle. They're, they're known for that. They're living for their own lust. 
he's, he's not really looking for wisdom because every reliable source of knowledge is seen as less than what he already knows. One of the first things we talked about, about wisdom is all the many sources there are. Wisdom's on every street corner. Wisdom's available in godly counsel. Wisdom is available even in creation itself. But again, if you're going to, it's not easy to receive unless, as we just talked about, unless you're humble enough to hear it, unless you're willing to repent. And so it requires, again, really just the very basic core of that person's life to change. How they would treat everybody else, how they would would receive counsel. It's It's got to be a Really, a, that's about as basic a transformation as you can get to, to be shot down, be humble, repent, and change. Well, it has to be a heart change. I want to change it. Scott Burke has no, no, he's never going to change because he's right about everything. They do change sometimes. We'll see that today. It, it, what, the point, of, I'm, you're right, typically not. But the point of Solomon's wisdom is, it's possible, isn't it? I've been, I've been defining wisdom as being equal to discipline. The discipline to receive teaching, the discipline to apply the teaching, the discipline to correct yourself when need be. If they'll apply it, yes, it, it's possibly changed. I'm going to share a case of that with you today. But instead, this hardened scoffer, this one that's just, that's the manner of living. Look at Proverbs 19 and verse 28. Again, these are some pretty ugly pictures. We'll get to prettier pictures of folks shortly, but uh, Proverbs 19 and verse 28. Solomon's using some really strong language here. Uh, New American Standard says a rascally witness makes a mockery of justice. Some translations will say a worthless witness. And the mouth of the wicked spreads iniquity. Or some, again, some would say a mouth of the wicked gulps down iniquity. So he's spewing all of this. Who's really taking it in? Who's being harmed by it? himself really this is the person who again is certain they're the only one that's right but he's gullible then to his own lies as he's spreading it he's also gulping it in being deceived himself who's the hardest person to influence to change the ones who is deceived and i mentioned that Solomon's using some strong language here. This word for rascally, or if your translation says worthless, that's the word belial. Who's belial? Pardon? Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a name for Satan. It's a name of Satan. Here it's being translated as worthless or rascally. And so it makes plain that those who are perverting justice, those who are not treating people with fairness, those who are tearing down everybody, insulting things, those people are servants of Satan. You know, whether it's you know, popular culture or politics or even in the church, those who are perverting justice are doing Satan's bidding. It's, it's a work of, of mockery. In the time of their punishment, they, they will perish. So, what is the end of the unrepentant mocker? Again, the same end of any unrepentant sinners, those who are, who are serving their own lust, pursuing their own lust, the end is eternal destruction. So, what can be done? What can be done? Look at Proverbs 22 and verse 10. Again, this is about your associations. 
If, if by your associations you're, you're being led the wrong way or by those who associate with you, you are in living in a constant state of turmoil. Proverbs 22 and verse 10, drive out the scoffer. Drive out the scoffer and contention will go out. Even strife and dishonor will cease. Sometimes you have to have to do that. If if there is a, this one who is, is continually uh, troubling your personal life, continually troubling, we could say even in the church, continually uh, s causing dissension just by sometimes just to be contentious. Well, even strife and dishonor will cease. The, the strife, the dishonor there is they're insulting your set standard of living. If you're determined, as, if we're determined here as a body to ma maintain a righteous standard in all our conduct and somebody's tearing that down, what do you have to do? You may have to con consider this. It's... Sometimes the only way to, to, to live a calm and contented, confident life is to remove that which is, is destroying it or seeking to destroy it. It's a good Old Testament commentary on Romans 16 and verse 17. You, 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 turn, you turn away from the troublemaker and you receive, relieve yourself of the trouble. And... Then, what, as we considered in a previous ver Proverbs 9, verses 7 through 9, what happens then if you remove the troublemaker, relieve yourself of this, project, this, this problem, what do we see happens there? The, the wise grow wiser. Those who have knowledge are able to increase in knowledge. Why? Because you're not distracted by all this noise. And sometimes to benefit the 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 body or to benefit whether it's in the in the doing business in the physical world or in the church sometimes you just have to disassociate with that get one translation again this is the McCord translation I've been reading it some lately it says expel the scoffer and contention disappears the quarreling ceases sometimes you just have to do that it is, again, good commentary on all the other Proverbs, and there are many of them that talk about being careful about your association. The wise people join themselves to other wise people. The fools, well, you hope you can get them to change so that they'll also be joined with the wiser people. But again, they, they tend, the only way they can, a scoffer can be seen as having any worth is to pull people down. Look at Proverbs 24, verse 9. The, the scoffer is essentially tearing down a righteous standard of living. And doing so, it, the devising of folly is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to men. That's why you would disassociate with such a one. But, you know, we always talk about the action, you know, the action being the sin. What's he called the sin here? Just the thought leading up to it. As James talks about, you know, when you're first tempted... What, do you, what ought not happen? You ought not let it go any further than the thought. Because if the thought is continued, then you're going to start devising the folly. When's the sin? The devising is when you permit yourself to do it, isn't it? The devising is when you start to rationalize a, a godly standard. Uh, remember in the past talking about what in the criminal justice system is called the assault cycle, and it's really the sin cycle for all people. When you've got this desire, this lust to, to do something, 
It's usually because you think you, it'll make you happy. You think it'll make you feel good. And then you think, well, I deserve to feel good, don't I, Deborah? And so if I deserve to feel good, then, well, then whatever I desire, devise to make that happen has got to be right. Well, no, it's not. So when, when have you gone too far? When you actually committed the action or when you're sitting there going, yeah, I really deserve this. I, th I think I can make this happen. You know, that's, that's just the folly. <laughs> that pride that pride thing well we already talked about it. the first thing you got in Solomon does too the only way you'll ever receive knowledge is humility isn't it there's two true two rec prerequisites for knowledge two prerequisite for wisdom revering the things of God and humility to receive the instruction of God Aha, uh -huh, now we're getting done. <laughs> and I face it, we tend to think, well, hey, I'm this age and they're just a punky teenager and well, I do know a few punky teenagers that were very knowledgeable, insightful Christians. And it's because they've devoted themselves to that. They were raised to receive that and to, to receive the instruction with understanding. It's, that's typically what is... Yeah, it's typically what a scoffer will not allow to happen. Did you say when you were saying about him and Jess? Yeah. It's the same way the other way, too. Yeah. And, and that's what we read about in Proverbs 9, verses 7 through 9. When receiving understanding, then the knowledge they have increases, the wisdom they can apply increases. It's, but it all begins, you've got to at least be open to hearing. The, uh, on this matter of, of scoffing, I want, I want to sh uh, share a, a personal story, uh, not for the reason to, to shame anybody, but to begin to make the point that Deborah and I alluded to, that it is possible to change. There was a sister in the church down where we lived in Orange, Texas, and she was a schemer. It was her nature. She was seeking to break up any friendship among any of the ladies in the congregation. And she would do it as, as Solomon used the word, a, a rascally witness, Belial. She would, she would spread lies and about, well, this woman said something against that sister, and then she said something because she said it about her. And every friendship that was in that congregation of about 260 people was all falling apart. And it was this woman, very attractive. She was the, the beauty queen type and actually had been one. But, you know, she wanted to break up every other relationship so that she would be the only friend that anyone would desire in the whole place. So, couldn't trust you, couldn't trust you, couldn't trust you, but you can trust me, she says. You know, we read that uh, verse about needing to expel the scoffer. And it happened in that case at that time. She was, she was not repentant of that. And so, her very fine husband, it, it became clear he was going to have to move and his family and take them to another congregation. 
And yes, they went to that other congregation with that congregation's full knowledge of the situation. And it was ugly. But it did, you know, what she didn't count on was that her sisters in that church would be wise enough to see through that scheme. And did, and that they would, would go and ch check out the facts for themselves. And so the scoffer had, it, it all backfired on her. On her. Well, it, it is an ugly picture of that. But the, the scoffer, even she could be changed by the means of discipline. Look at Proverbs 19 and verse 25. Strike a scoffer, and the naive may become shrewd. We think of shrewd in, I think, a negative sense, but shrewd in a matter of discernment, that you can start seeing things for what they really are. Strike a scoffer, and the naive may become shrewd, but reprove the one who is, has understanding, and he will gain knowledge. Well, this, this one that you reprove, if they receive the reproving, then they'll be changed, won't they? Again, it's a matter of being humble enough to receive it and, and then being willing to repent and then gain knowledge. And so it is a possible, possible to turn. It, it's, it's tough lessons, of course, but it's all a matter of wisdom being attained by discipline. And that's why I told you that story. A couple of weeks ago, I was thinking about that family, so I tried to look them up on Facebook and found it to be amazingly interesting, or easy. Found exactly where they live now and what they've been doing in the last 40 years. Both of them are serving very faithfully in a, in a church on the north side of Houston. He's been an elder for years. She's been devoted Bible class teacher for decades, very much involved, very much you know in the fabric of the church. And you see, she changed. She was reproved. There was a tremendous cost, a consequence of a, at that time. She left in her wake the need for a lot of healing in a congregation. They healed. She did too. How did it come about? Discipline. Discipline. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Discipline. And by her experience, her husband, who is now an elder, is certainly better equipped to, to deal with that kind of problem in a, in a large congregation. And so, as ugly as these pictures of a scoffer are, what's the most loving thing you can do? Discipline, reproof. Is it always gonna be accepted? No. But when it is, lives can be changed and changed for the better. Someone, whether they learn the lesson or not, that, per that person is going to bear the consequences of their action. Look back at Proverbs, yes. A lot of times with discipline, people's feelings get hurt first. Oh and yeah. And then they have time to go home, think about it, you know, figure out if they were wrong or not, and then repent and yeah. not do that same action again. They learn by that discipline. Yeah. And sometimes the discipline is the consequences of it. Yeah. Going home and feeling that pain. Because you've hurt, uh, you not only hurt yourself, you've hurt others. And, and fortunately, that such a person is going to go home and think about it. And really can still be touched by that. Because going and telling what somebody else told you not to tell, and <laughs> back, that, that's oh. gossip. You yeah, know, yeah. Gossip is a hurtful thing throughout the Bible. Well, we're going to, in our next topic, we're still taking this topically, we're going to be talking about the friend and the neighbor and how a friend and a neighbor would handle that kind of stuff. And what typically happens, what you're talking about, somebody offends somebody else, 
and rather than doing what Matthew 18 teaches before they got it before if I offended somebody else maybe even before I got home to think about it like you're thinking about somebody could call everybody else and said you know what he did <laughs> you know that's not the way to do it but in, in this particular case I told you about in Texas it was handled very well extremely well and look at the benefit And they're lifelong friends 40 years later because, because you were built up in wisdom together. You came through it together. And you were strengthened by it. On her terms, too. <laughs> on her terms. But in, if, when I would reach out and have other friends, then she would, like, disown me. And I kept having to go to her, you know, what is the problem? What did I do? You know. And she never had an answer, really. And then we'd be friends for a little bit. And by the time I got into sophomore year in high school, I realized she wanted me to be solely her friend. And she didn't want me to have any other friend. Which is not being your friend. <laughs> right. yeah. Which in the church, that can't be. Ought you not can't be. have yeah. just one friend. Yeah. The whole congregation needs to be your friend. In, in this matter, still with the scoffer though, whether you're wise or you continue to be the scoffer, look at Proverbs 9 and verse 12. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. Not talking about being selfish, but he's talking about you, you benefit. And if you scoff, you alone will bear it. There is a consequence. The wise become yet wiser still in a good way. And the scoffer who would not repent is going to bear the consequences. And even before repenting, even if they do repent, there's still going to be some consequences sometimes. Proverbs 19 and verse 29. Again, there, there are consequences. Proverbs 19, verse 29. Judgments are prepared for scoffers and blows for the back of fools. Another translation says condemnation is in store for scorners and lashes for the backs of fools. There are consequences to it. The, the person who would hear the reproof and receive the rebuke and be changed by it, certainly they might yet bear the consequences, but coming out on the other end of it are going to be far better for it. And so all this is why I've been defining wisdom as discipline, as Paul would say in his letter, first letter to Timothy. The, talking about the teaching, the reproof for correction, for training in righteousness. Somebody who receives that, how do you come out on the other end of it, Jeff? <laughs> you come out as a transformed person, don't you? I mean, if you're really receiving the teaching and the correction and the reproof, and the training, then you got to be changed by it. You have to be changed by it. Uh huh. Well, 
Well, that, that's why I, I mentioned earlier the definition of wisdom is the skills to live according to a set standard. It's not what I think is right today or what you think is right tomorrow or what might change by culture next year. It's the skills to live by a set standard. So by what would, by what ought we be reproving someone? The word. Absolutely. <laughs> Harder. Yeah. And we'll see that when we get to the topic of friends and neighbors. It's, uh, it's sometimes easier to, I'd say oftentimes. so attached to a friend or a neighbor. But no, but still, it's like our church friends, our family. Yeah. Yeah. But still, we get to be honest with it. Biological family. Well, your blood and heart is that's involved in your biological family. Yeah, it's one thing if I disassociate from somebody in, that I know in the world that's influencing me to do wrong. But, whew, to do it with family. And, and I know what you mean. I, real frankly, and I've mentioned this before, I, I have a good father, but he will not hear anything about the gospel. He decided years ago from four words taken out of context in the book of Revelation, it says, whosoever will may come. And he says, I will, so I'll be there. That's the sum of his doctrine. Well, I'm, <laughs> we understand that's not how it works. Whosoever will may come in the matter that we were called to come. But he's, he's not going to, he won't listen to that reproof. And, it, and it's hard because generations of my family have not been members of the church. It's, it's, hey, how many of us know this, that story? Yes, Mary. And again, that, that's just not wise counsel, is it? It's not wise teaching. It's not training in righteousness to take, we know it, to take one verse and, and base the sum of your doctrine on it. You can't do it. Yes, sir. You know, that, that brings up a good point because we are distinguishing with family and family. Our biological family means a lot. But... The Bible tells us that we are a family. We're not like a family. We are a family of Christians. The, the, the amount of devotion, love, desire for a biological family should be the same for us as a church. There should be that same amount of love and that. But we have distinguished that to where it's, it's not as close when in all reality, I mean, he tells us, you know, we shouldn't put our father or our mother or anybody above God. And if we're a part of God's family, then that actually should be the strongest one. And we tend to make excuses for our blood family. Exactly. Well, we wouldn't. Right. We wouldn't the church. And we should have that same amount of love and care that we would, I mean, if it if my father, sister, mother, brother, whatever, was in dire need of something, I drop everything. Do we have that same amount of love and care and diligence in our church family? 
if someone was in need. Everything you're saying brings to mind the phrase, there's this one that sticks closer to you than a brother. And that's what it ought to be. I have a sister that used the scripture that we are the church. We the people are the church. Mm -hmm. She said, so when she started getting ill, she did not have to go to the church building anymore because she was part of the church. So if she took time to sit at her table on Sunday morning and read the Bible, she was still being part of the church family. The, and uh, I could not convince her. Well, that's people who look at the church as an institution. And it's, uh, we'll touch on it in the lesson this morning. The church is instituted in people, isn't it? So if you're not with the people, not, and uh, that's tough. I mean, that's the same folks that say, well, I can go out here and worship on the mountain while I'm out hunting. Yeah. No, <laughs> that's, that's a whole different thing. But again, to this matter, uh, we won't get into the friends and neighbors today, but to this matter of somebody that would reject what you were trying to, um, as we just considered, there is sadly going to be a consequence to that. There, to those who in humility and repentance would receive that teaching, there's indeed a, a blessing. But to those as the one you mentioned and to those that, that I mentioned, you've got to finally just, probably for Solomon and, and a lot of people, the hardest part of receiving wisdom is first admitting, I don't know it all. It's, I'm not in control, it's not up to me. And even, I mean, it's impossible. <laughs> I, I can't control it all. And if I, when I try to, what have I done? You chuckle as if you know, Deborah. We make a mess of it, don't we? We make a mess of it. And so again, it's this matter of discipline. To receive the correction, to be trained in righteousness, and to evermore know your dependence on godly counsel, the humility to receive it. I guess we best tie it up right there for this morning. Next week we'll talk about being a friend and a neighbor.